Good evening, the time is now 6 p.m. I'd like to call to order the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting for the City of Vacaville, September 1, 2021. We appreciate everyone who is participating in tonight's Parks and Recreation teleconference meeting. This meeting will be conducted pursuant to the Governor's Executive Order N-29-20. Please bear with us as we attempt to use remote tools. Instructions to call into the meeting or participate from a computer are provided on the city's web agenda on the city's website at www.cityofvacaville.com. Callers who wish to comment can press star nine to get into the speaking queue. Computer users can click the raise hand button within their Zoom controls to request to speak. Good evening, Madam Secretary, roll call please. Commissioner Baruman. Present. Commissioner Gutierrez. Here. Commissioner Leonard. Here. Commissioner Thompson. I am present. Commissioner Vanderchulin. Present. Vice Chair Vasquez. Here. And Chair McMahon. Present. Vice Chair Vasquez, welcome back, ma'am. Would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Of course. Um, if everyone could please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, ma'am. Item three, approval of the agenda. Madam Secretary, are there any corrections or changes to tonight's agenda? I have none, Chair. Having none, I will accept a motion. Oh. Make a motion or approve the minute, um, approve the agenda, I'm sorry. Okay, we have Bruman and a second, please. Uh, Chairman, I'll, I'll second, but I did notice that at the very top it says via teleconference and that uh, mission meeting was actually held in person. I'm sorry, can you say that again, Commissioner Thompson? Um, the uh, notes of the August 4th um, Parks and Recreation Commission meeting at the very top of the notes of the minutes, it says held via teleconference, but that is actually the only meeting we've held recently that was in person. Okay, and, and I understand that. So we're currently on number three, which is approval of tonight's agenda. So we will- I'm sorry. That, um, here shortly. I apologize. No, no worries. Thank you very much, sir. So at this point, let's look at um, item number three, approval of the agenda. So we have Bruman for a motion and I need a second, please. I'll second. This is Vice Chair Vasquez. Okay, we have Bruman and Vasquez. Roll call vote. Commissioner Bruman. Aye. Commissioner Gutierrez? Aye. Commissioner Leonard? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Commissioner Vanderchulin? Yes. Vice Chair Vasquez? Yes. Chair McMahon? Yes. Okay, very good. The motion passes. We are now at item number four, approval of the minutes. So approval of the minutes for the meeting of August the 4th, 2021. And Commissioner Thompson did bring up that um, it does say via teleconference on there. Can we make that correction, please, Madam Secretary? Yes. So the correction will read uh, in person. Um, with that correction, I will accept a motion. I will motion to approve since I um, got it out of order in the first place. No worries, sir, thank you. And a second, please. I will second. We have Thompson and Bruman. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Bruman. Aye. Commissioner Gutierrez. Aye. Commissioner Leonard. Aye. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Vanderchulin. Yes. Vice Chair Vasquez. Abstain. Chair McMahon. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. Item number five, communications. Madam Secretary, are there any communications um, this evening for the meeting?
apologize. Sorry, my computer. I, we have received none, Chair. Thank you very much. Moving along to item number six, presentations. Tonight we have Vacaville Performing Arts Theater and Onstage Vacaville. Tonight we have our theater manager, Rachel Morgan, and Onstage Vacaville President, Lisa Hylas. Good evening, ladies. Good evening. Good evening. Very good. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for allowing us to present the Vacaville Performing Arts Theater. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Rachel Morgan. I've been working at VPAC since 2013 and in the management position for seven and a half years now. I am employed by Venue Tech Management Group, the management firm contracted with the city to manage the Vacaville Performing Arts Theater since 1998. The theater itself opened in 1993 and recently celebrated its 28th anniversary. This presentation will give you an idea of how the facility is managed, the nonprofit that Venue Tech aided in creating to support the theater, recent achievements, how we succeeded through closures, future goals, and upcoming events. Next slide. Next slide, please. The Vacaville Performing Arts Theater is city owned and managed by Venue Tech Management Group. Onstage Vacaville is a community voice and fundraising arm associated with the theater. Venue Tech Management Group works alongside supporting the Parks and Recreation Department to manage the facility. Next slide. Venue Tech Management Group has been in business for over 30 years, providing consultation and management to performing arts venues and producing professional events. Venue Tech currently manages five theaters in California. The entire staff of the VPAT are Venue Tech employees. There are 12 employees, two full-time and 10 part-time. We take pride in the fact that all of our on-site employees are Solano County residents. The city most recently entered into a five-year agreement with Venue Tech in 2018. Next slide. Along with the management, staffing, and production of rentals, Venue Tech works hand in hand with the Parks and Recreation Department to develop and implement the operating budget and booking production and promotion of nationally touring artists in the annual season of show series. Next slide. Onstage Vacaville is an independent nonprofit that aids in setting the stage for the future of Vacaville's cultural arts by many advancements in engagement and cultivation of a broad and diverse array of entertainment for all ages and interests while supporting the local performing arts groups. The board of directors is comprised of volunteer members who are dedicated to not only supporting VPAT, but also the local arts community. The successful support is done through memberships and fundraising towards the cultural growth grant that offsets theater costs for rental clients and facilitating education and exposure to the arts within the community's youth population. Specific projects include sponsorships and grants totaling close to $250,000, the annual Air Force Band of the Golden West Holiday Concert that's free to the back of our community, and the Air Force Band of the Golden West Student Immersion that allows local musicians an up close and personal rehearsal with the members of the globally touring band. Onstage Vacaville has created and implemented many new projects over the past 18 months that President Lisa Hollis will share. Commission, I introduce Lisa Hollis, the president of Onstage Vacaville. Next slide. Thank you, Rachel. And good evening to the commissioners. Thank you for having me. My name is Lisa Hylas. I'm the current president of Onstage Vacaville. I've been in this role for approximately two years and been on the board for five years. So um, we're actually excited to be celebrating Onstage Vacaville's 20th anniversary. We were chartered in December of 2001. So a lot has happened in the last 20 years. Certainly a lot in the news going on about the last 20 years, and it's just been a very successful um, nonprofit. So I've been proud to be part of it. One of the things that we discovered as the pandemic hit the performing arts community is that we were not prepared to really continue on as an entity without our own identity. And what I mean by that is we were sharing a couple of pages on the VPAT website, but there really wasn't anywhere you could go directly to interface with Onstage Vacaville. And why that's important is that traditionally we have been the funding arm of the season of shows programs that are handed out whenever you go to a season of shows event. 
And what we do is we go out and we knock on doors and we have some wonderful sponsors and advertisers who basically pay for the production of the program. So we had already collected the money in 2019 for the program. We had it printed. And as you know, we um, are on a fiscal year, July 1, just like the theater. So the season of shows actually starts, you know, in the fall. So we started our season in the fall of 2019. And then, as you know, in the spring, as the season was getting going, everything was shut down. So we found ourselves realizing that we had a box of literally hundreds and hundreds of programs in a box with corporate sponsor logos on them with no way to thank those sponsors or give them any of the press and publicity that we had promised. So the first thing we did was we sent a letter to each and every one of them and we said, we will carry your advertisement through into the next year. You know, we won't, it's not your fault that you didn't get a full season, even though we already had to absorb the cost of that. So we sent that letter and then we hired a company to um, Y Squared Creative Solutions to develop a new website for us. And now we have our ability to do this advertising in the digital space. And I think really for us, it's been an opportunity to look at process and say, you know, really doing things by snail mail and such at the end of the day when you're shut down doesn't work. So we developed a brand new website and marketing strategy with social media. We have the ability now to purchase memberships online through our own website and donate and learn about past donors and stories. And, and so that's what we've been up to um, in terms of process. And you'll be seeing more of that um, in, the, in the meetings to come. Um, so one of the things that we decided to do being in this lockdown was saying, you know, how can we broaden our scope of who we touch in the community? And we asked VPAT to let us know who are the top four people that consistently rent the theater over and over and over. And we were given a list of the Vacaville Ballet Company, Solano Symphony, um, Starbound Theater, and the Young Artists Conservatory of Music. And so basically, they have to fundraise in order to afford to rent the theater, although they do get you know, a discounted rate if they're a nonprofit. So we said, why don't we do a Giving, camp Giving Tuesday campaign where we would do a match so for whatever dollars were donated, we would match up to $5,000. And then those monies would go directly back to help these four theater groups offset their theater costs when they are able to come back to the stage. And so we're proud to say as a result of this effort, we raised $5,000. And one of our first um, partners just was able to take advantage of a $1,250 discount. So I think we felt like we were a beacon um, of support for the rental clients because let's face it, they are really the bread and butter of the Vacaville Performing Arts Theater. So we've decided to continue to focus on how we can help them continue to do what they do. I mean, performing arts is very different than, for example, being in school or on Zoom. You can't really get a ballet company together on Zoom to practice and to do all these things. And like they lost their ability to do the Nutcracker, which is not only a, you know, a favorite of the community, but a big moneymaker for them. So that's been part of our focus. We, we've always done the um, cultural growth grants, which we will still continue to do. As a matter of fact, we are working with the Solano office, County Office of Education to um, work with one of their um, groups, the Joe H. Folta Film Festival. So we're working on that right now. Um, in the past, there was a membership designation I'm changing gears here, <laughs> it was called Court Jester Circle Members. And these were members that had contributed individually or you know, $5,000 or more to the theater. And they were given special perks. And there had always been a vision to have their name on the wall somewhere in the theater, but that has just never come to fruition. So I was determined to lead an effort to get this done. So we've uh, hired a group that's going to create a rendition that we think is pretty fabulous and it will be unveiled hopefully um, at some kind of cocktail reception where we can invite these members and kind of unveil this, this new um, plaque for lack of a better word. And so we're very excited about that. And then we decided that there was no really reason to close this court jester membership level 
um, we're just going to leave, leave it open-ended indefinitely. And if someone really wants to walk up to me and hand me a check for $5,000, I will always be available for that. I will make myself personally available. And then we'll find ways to add on to this project by adding the name in maybe a scroll or what have you. So more to come, and you will all be invited to that in the day when we don't have to worry about COVID-19. Um, the other thing that I've been spending a lot of time on is with an American Rescue Plan grant that's sort of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The federal government is granting over $100 million to small performing arts nonprofits. And I could probably learn to fly a plane more easily than I've had to <laughs> learn how to uh, connect with the federal government on a grant, but having said that, we are asking for a $50,000 grant, $25,000 per year for two years, and that will cover all of our operational costs and then free us up to be giving to cultural growth grants. I know that we have someone from the Wild West Film Festival who really wants to put on an accurate depiction of history showing how Black Americans and Chinese and women played a part, um, sort of how the West was run. We might want to do something like that. So if we can get some basic operational costs covered, that would be great. I mean, obviously, we've lost our ability to fundraise completely. And then we also have this encumbered um, obligation with the, with the advertisers that we have to roll over. So that's really in a nugget, a nugget what, I, what I had to say today. It's just, to me, astounding that so many people that walked before me um, and my board have contributed almost a quarter million dollars to the city of Acaville. So having said that, thank you for your time. Ladies, thank you so much. It's um, nice to hear from the VPAT. It's been a little while and we missed the VPAT and um, it's so important to this town. So Lisa, thank you very much. Welcome aboard and thank you for all you do and um, for your new ideas. And um, again, um, the, the performing arts theater here in, in Vacaville is very important to all of us. So thank you. At this point, I will open it up to the commission for- um, Chair McMahon. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Director Walker. I don't think the presentation is complete. Quite done. Yes, I have just a little bit more. I'm Thank sorry. you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. I do apologize for that. I That's okay. I'll be fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you'll see here on this slide, VPAT by the numbers. We just broke down really quickly for you. Um, kind of what we do on an annual basis. Yeah, annually the theater hosts approximately 150 performances or events. Um, we have about 50,000 people that enter the doors. The theater has a very active volunteer program with 25 volunteers that average 1,700 hours per year that support the front of house operations through ushering and ticket taking. Our single highest user of the theater is the Vacaville Unified School District with over 20 events per year. On average, there are 70 plus performing groups, acts, and event producers, 90% of those being local. So as you can see by the numbers, we are fairly busy throughout the year. Next slide, please. It comes as no surprise the hard impact COVID-19 had on live performing arts. Theater particularly hard hit, leaving many venues with only the ghost light on for well over a year. The VPAT was affected similarly in that all part-time staff were furloughed while the building remained closed. We moved our box office operations remote. Management spent many hours on rescheduling, production, booking, and theatrical venue calls, discussing options for safe reopenings, recoveries, and outside the box opportunities to present live theater to our community. We successfully curated a VPAT Live From Home weekly email that went to 40,000 plus patrons on our email database. We also presented several virtual and live streamed events to include Jim Brickman and Benicia Ballet's spring performance, some of which BPAT received a portion of ticket sales revenue. Before the June 15th audience reopening, we safely accommodated a handful of recorded events with no audience members. And we have since brought our entire team back on for upcoming events, which are fortunately abundant. Next slide. Our single most significant achievement of the past year has been the successful award of the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. The SVOG was created to provide grants to organizations that suffered revenue loss due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The granted award totaled $216,146. 
within the past few days, we actually received notification that there is now a supplemental grant available to the theater that we will be seeking out. Unfortunately, we did lose our ticketing system as a result of COVID business closures, but have since migrated to a new ticketing software system. The system is robust. It allows for an interactive seat map, simplified sales process to include donations and memberships where we can continue to support onstage backables, um, progress and sponsorship accessibility. We have also upgraded our recording and internet equipment to allow for future live streaming capabilities. Next slide. Our future goals include live streaming access to all of our rental clients as a revenue generating add-on service. Our proximity to the Air Force Brace brings in many transplant families who would be thrilled to share their productions with extended family and friends who could not physically attend. This could also bring a benefit to individuals who may still be uncomfortable with returning to an in-person venue. The patio has been damaged due to transient damage. The reconstruction of the patio with access to the lobby specifically for the restrooms would create additional rental space for pre or post show receptions, parties, independent from a theatrical performance and much more. We were approached many times during the closures requesting information on utilizing the shared courtyard in the cultural center for outdoor productions. We're determining if the courtyard is a potential rental space for smaller outdoor performances, movies, etc. Next slide. Spring and fall months are notoriously our busiest season of the year. With the impact of COVID requiring many events to reschedule and local venues to not reopen, we are currently managing a calendar as we've never seen before. I wanna point out that we are now booked every day with rehearsals and performances from November 5th through December 30th, with the exception of Thanksgiving day only. We're also booked with at least one rental every weekend from January 6th to July 1st. We're in a position now where we're having to turn away potential rental clients because of our limited calendar availability. Um, while that is a good problem to have, we hope that we can bring all of those that are interested in performing at the theater into the building soon. Next slide. The theater produces annually a season of shows which includes four to six nationally touring artists. We have seen the likes of Clint Black, Smokey Robinson, Wilson Phillips, Time Jumpers featuring Vince Gill, Boys to Men, Los Lobos, Leanne Rams, Peter White, Joe Nichols, Vicki Lawrence, Sarah Evans, and many, many more. These shows are selected many months in advance by the season selection committee. Because of closures and rescheduling both venue and artist caused, the 2019-2020 season of shows has shifted to the 2021-2022 months. We have four exciting artists taking the stage as early as November 5th with ukulele master Jake Shimbakuro, February 26th with the Purple Experience, a five-piece group entertaining Prince fans with his classic hits, Los Chicos, the Selena Experience on April 1st, and Menopause and Musical on May 15th. Next slide, please. Thank you again for your time. We hope this gave you a comprehensive overview of the theater and we look forward to seeing each of you in the audience soon. If you have questions, I or Judy Barquette would be happy to answer. All right, once again, thank you so much, ladies. And, and like I said, just a few minutes ago when I wasn't supposed to speak, thank you so much. The theater is very important um, to this town and, and you um, all do a great job there. So thank you very much. At this time, I will open it up to the commission for comments or questions. Commissioner Leonard. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Judy, Rachel, and Lisa for a great presentation. It's so nice to connect and see the theater starting again. Um, it really is kind of a cornerstone of the community that was very um, missed. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, Lisa and all of the onstage Vacaville volunteers. I know volunteerism is often thankless um, and you do make a huge difference. Most theaters across the country are subsidized and um, your, your contribution is greatly appreciated. It makes a big difference. So thank you to you and your board for all the work that you're doing. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Any other commissioner comments or questions? 
I see none. Ladies, thank you so much for all you do. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Item number seven, business from the floor. This is the time to address the commission with issues that are not on the agenda that are within the commission's subjects matter jurisdiction. Maximum three minutes per speaker. Madam Secretary, do we have any callers on the line now? Yes, um, Tony Mraz, I will open your mic. Yes, sir, you have three minutes. So, Tony, you have to unmute. Okay, now. There you go. Thank you very much. I'm Tony Moross. I've lived in Vacaville since Christmas of 1994. And thank you for this opportunity to share my perceptions of the status of tennis in Vacaville today. The Vacaville tennis community has had a home base at the sports club in Browns Valley for decades, even before my arrival. Since the club met our needs for courts and programs, we seldom used public facilities. The atmosphere and, and the interactions there built a sense of family and connections. And our play put, us on, put the Vacaville name on the national tennis map. In our post-pandemic world, in-shape management has walked away from tennis. Their no guest policy precludes league play. They have eliminated the tennis director position and they've removed the tennis nets on four of the nine courts. When, USA, when USTA opened up league play in the spring, we scrambled to find courts to play on. Elizabeth Crisante was key in coordinating with USTA and NorCal to allow us to play on the Centennial Park courts. We also began the process of organizing a community tennis association. Our SCTA is now incorporated as a 5013C. C3 nonprofit. The SETA mission, our passion is to keep tennis alive and growing in Vacaville and Northern Solano County. One part of the dream is to find a home base, a new home base for the tennis community in Vacaville. That would mean courts and a resident pro. When I met some of the commissioners on July 24th at Centennial Park, I learned that the new master plans for Parks and Recs and Centennial Park were being revised and that the city's vision of the park in the future showed current four courts going away replaced by two new courts in a different location. You need to know that this will not meet the needs of your tennis community. How did we get to this place? The April 2021 PRNP states that the master plan engagement process was designed to review and confirm the findings from the 2013 recreational needs assessment. That 2013 RNA documents that community input was obtained through surveys, town halls, workshops, and outreach to indoor sports stakeholders. They eventually on page 45, concluded that it appears there is not a substantial tennis playing community within Vacaville. I submit that this statement is blatantly untrue and unfortunately underlies city plans regarding tennis even today. The RNA shows the nine tennis courts at Millennium in shape, but never acknowledges that the needs of a vibrant tennis community were being met by the sports club. Instead, it concluded that there was no tennis community in Vacaville. To be accurate, the RNA collusion should have stated that their survey showed no great demand for tennis on public courts because those needs were being met by the private sports club. So now because of in-shape corporate decisions, those needs are now on your plate. We ask that you let the new SCTA be part of the conversation about the future of tennis in the community. Allow us to work with the city as we pursue our dream of a new tennis home base. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much for your comments. You're welcome. Next caller, please. There are no more hands, Chair. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, no further comments from the public. We will close public comment. Um, would anyone from the staff like to address Mr. Maris's um, comments on um, tennis in Vacaville? If I may, um, Mr. Commission Chair? Yes, sir. Um, we have been working with um, Tony and his group to um, make arrangements to expand the hours over at Centennial Park uh, Tennis Courts, which involves maybe temporarily getting some um, portable lighting because the you know if, if you have lighting, you can play later in the evening, you can expand a little bit. Um, so we have been working with that group. We understand that they've done a lot to get their 501c3. Uh, and uh, we understand that we only have one lit tennis court over at uh, at Three Oaks, but I think there's some opportunities there and we will be meeting with that group and, and looking at those opportunities that we have moving forward. In addition to uh, 
we have this bank of hours that the city um, uses for the, with the school district that we can we can use city uh, school district facilities. And so we're going to we'll be working with the school district as well to see if we can use those that bank of hours and bank of time bank of time to work with Tony's group and maybe temporarily move some of the programs out there as well. So there's some options out there that we're looking at and we'll continue to work with Tony to to um, to help that group. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Reggie. And uh, Tony, thank you very much. I know that um, you've uh, sent several emails and um, the, the staff has answered several of those emails and we appreciate it. And um, we look forward to working with you. Um, so thank you very much for that, sir. And thank you, Reggie. Item 8A, business, Madam Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This evening, we are completing our journey and our two, our last stop uh, on our roadmap. So this is road stop number nine. It is regarding program development process and Recreation Manager Reggie Hubbard and Recreation Manager Melody Ocampo will be presenting this item. Uh, thank you, Director Walker. Uh, good evening, uh, Commission Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. Yes, program development. This is our last uh, road stop, as Carrie explained, um, and we're excited about this. It's been, I think we started this over a year ago, and we've gone through a lot of park-related things, budget, et cetera. So program development is our last stop. And so with that said, uh, next slide, Tracy. Most programs are broken out into two main categories, contractual programs and staff-led programs. Uh, I will walk us through the contractual program portion and Mel will walk us through the staff led programs and just some examples of contract program classes. Uh, th those really include more of the specialized programs, ballet, uh, music, cooking classes, voice lessons, things of that nature. And most of the, the staff led programs are, are some of more of our traditional programs, the like TGIF program, our preschool, adult softball, t-ball. Um, some of the more universal programs. Um, next slide, Tracy. So contractual programs typically have three main components. They start with a program proposal. They go through an approval process. And if approved, we will execute the contract. So we'll, we'll go through some of the more detailed uh, areas of the approval process on the next few slides. So uh, next slide, Tracy. So this is where it starts. It starts with our approval with our um, program proposal. Some of the key items in the program proposal include outcomes. Uh, we want to know what should the participant expect to get from the class. Um, also a program description, which is intended for our events guide and other marketing materials. And every contractual program starts with this proposal. We try to get as much information on the front end from the co contractor as possible just to make sure we're clear on what they're offering. Um, the duration of the class, any supply fees, the age of the part participants, et cetera, and also a short bio of the contractor that we'll be dealing with. Uh, next slide, Tracy. So during the approval process, we want to make sure that we're not duplicating any services, and at the same time, we're potentially meeting an un unmet need in the community. We don't want to have, you know, five karate classes or, you know, 10 music classes because then we start to compete with, with each other. And we don't want our classes competing with each other. And at times we don't want to compete with some of the outside um, private groups as well because it's then the, the programs become watered down. So we want to make sure that we're not competing. We also want to make sure that the cost is affordable and it's, that it's, it's consistent with other classes uh, in the surrounding area. Um, because if we we can we can sometimes lowball ourselves and sometimes we can co cost ourselves out of the market. So we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Um, we also want to determine if the class falls under a specific category. If it's art, if it's sports, if it's special interests, this will determine which coordinator will oversee the program. And lastly, we'll um, determine the most appropriate space for the class. Senior classes are typically at the McBride Center. Um, classes that may need a stage, we'll put them at. Three Oaks, or maybe we'll use the theater. And of course, we research outdoor uh, venues um, as needed for space availability. Uh, next slide, Tracy. So this is a snapshot of our cover page for our contracts. And so we have to go through this process and everything has to be checked and reviewed and signed off. 
And some of the important points of the cover page for the contracts include the insurance piece to indemnify the city. We want to make sure that each class has adequate insurance. We do background checks, of course, and also uh, reference checks on each of our contractors. So this is a it's a pretty tedious process, but we've been doing this so long, we pretty have it down pat. But every uh, contract goes through this process. The final contract is drafted by the coordinators, is re uh, reviewed by the supervisors, and then ultimately it's signed off by our director. Uh, next slide, Tracy. So I'm going to hand it off to Mel real briefly, and she'll walk us through the staff-led programs. Thanks, Reggie. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Reggie covered a lot of ground there, and so I'm not going to um, repeat too much of what he said because a lot of that actually applies to our staff-led programs. Um, as you can see here, our new programs, um, we do try and release them annually and quarterly. Annually, we go through uh, our budget setting process, and through that process, coordinators are required to present new programs as part of their budget. We have some minimum requirements, um, depending on the program area, of four new programs. And then quarterly, we um, have new ideas that just come throughout the year. You know, we encourage our team to be creative, and then they might get inspired by other things or receive suggestions from our community. And so we try and allow for um, those things to be implemented. And that quarterly uh, approach is having to do with our guide, our events guide, and that comes out quarterly. So uh, as you can see, that's all aligned. Next slide. So where do these program ideas come from? So um, the main elements that you see here, participant surveys, online inquiries, um, suggestions from folks like yourself, our city council members, and then research and replication of other city programs. So these are some of the main things that, again, feed into what I just spoke about, which are those um, new program ideas that we require of our, our program staff. Next slide. Development. So the um, proposal process, similar to what Reggie went through in the elements that are required of a contract proposal, um, we do require, you know, a hefty description and that budget piece are the big elements that a coordinator will present to their supervisor. The supervisor will then bring that to a management team meeting. We will review that and evaluate for a lot of the things that Reggie mentioned, such as, is there competition? Do we have a space in our facility? Um, you know, how will this program lay out and fit into already existing programs and how will it be implemented? Once it is implemented, we then are evaluating it and revising it based on those evaluations, both internal evaluations and the feedback that we receive from the folks who participate in those programs. Next slide. So now we are ready to answer your questions and comments. So please shoot. Thank you very much for the presentation. I will now open it up to uh, Commissioner comments or questions. I see no uh, Commissioner comments. I will open it to the public. Madam Secretary, any callers for uh, this item? No callers, Chair. Thank you. We'll close public comment. Uh, once again, I'll bring it back to the Commission. I see none. Reggie, Melody, thank you so much. Our pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. We are now at 9A Committee Reports. Commissioner Bruman. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, sorry we can't meet in person, but hey, this will do for the time being. Um, but regarding Play for All Park, they are putting together a community awareness very much to let people know that, hey, it is still going to happen, and that's going to happen on October 23rd. Uh, between nine and one, and they'll have some games out there for the kids. We'll be selling bricks and T-shirts just to let the people know, hey, we are getting close. Everything's been ordered. So just to let them know that the park is still there and it will be happening. And that's pretty much it. Very good, Commissioner Rubin. Thank you very much. And we do look forward to October the 23rd between 9 and 1. Um, mm -hmm. This park has been in the planning phase for many years, and it's um, exciting to know that we're, we're getting there. We're almost there. It's getting there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Item uh, number 10, reports of park planner Hugh Hesterman. 
Good evening, Commission. Um, on uh, on your screen, hopefully, uh, Tracy can bring up. Thank you, Tracy. I have uh, primarily um, some update and uh, correction, not corrections, but some uh, new information to share about the status of the uh, Lower Lagoon Valley uh, Development Project and how it affects Lagoon Valley Park. Uh, Tracy, if you'd back up one slide, please. Yes, this is the large eight foot by four foot sign that um, is at the entrance to the uh, the front entrance to the Lagoon Valley Park. And there are smaller ones also posted at the um, southern entrance, the pedestrian entrance, and also at the end of Butcher Road. It basically attempts to um, apprise the public who use the park that there will be some um, disruption within the park for the installation of the utilities. And it also gives a, uh, there's a QR code there and a uh, reference to the city's webpage, which has uh, more information about the Lower Lagoon Valley Development Project. Um, so I, I anticipate that you may very well hear some, uh, some, some inquiries from the public about what actually is going on out there because there is a, a development happening inside the park. When I say development, I mean actually construction of both a sewer lift station, um, a water booster station, and then later on, there will be um, uh, tearing up the road to put sewer and water mains right through the, the center of the park. So Tracy, if you would please go to the next slide. These photos were taken today of the uh, site where the uh, sewer lift station is being constructed. And this is on the corner, uh, sort of diagonal from the dog park. So um, it's, it's what people see. And I have about five more of those. Uh, Tracy, please just slowly go through them. Gives you a little idea of what's being affected and where. By the way, hold on a sec, Tracy, if you'd back up one. Um, where About where I'm standing to take this photo is the location for the new restroom building, which won't be built for um, probably construction will begin in probably about a year. So that is... Uh, dependent on the sewer lift station for operations so um, because the sewage would all have to be pumped out of the valley just like uh, the sewage uh, generated from the development next slide please tracy and here's a view from on top of the hill uh, off to the far right you can just see the corner of the dog park and then on the kind of center to your view is the site of the sewer lift station it's being tucked into the hill to try to be as um, Inoculus as, as it can be. Next slide, please, Tracy. Uh, the trails that are affected have been marked off um, with trail close signs and detour signs. Um, also, it affects um, T17 and T21 of the uh, disc golf course. And the disc golf uh, clubs have been notified of this and the um, uh, you know, we'll need to work with them to try to figure out how to uh, replace those tees. Next slide, Tracy. This is the uh, trail, uh, the Lenante Trail, actually, on the top of the hill. These gentlemen had uh, had gone past the signs that say the trail is closed, um, and somebody had knocked those signs down. I just I just put them back up, but. Uh, it, uh, the trail at the other end by the booster station is actually closed off. And I'll give you another photo of that if Tracy would advance another slide. So this is the uh, North Pass Trail, as if you were coming up the hill from uh, Butcher Road. And you can see one of the city water tanks off to the right. The entire area is fenced off for construction. And in about the center of your view is where the booster pump uh, station will be constructed. And I have a couple more reviews of that. Tracy, please. Looking the other direction, you can see where the, yep. And then uh, you can see the tank off to the left of the side and about in the center of the view is roughly where the booster station will be built. And Blainanti Trail, which is at the bottom corner left of your view, will be um, re, uh, reoriented because uh, it used to go right through this, this work area. It'll have to uh, take a turn and go down to the North Pass Trail in a steeper fashion than was previously. Next slide, please. 
Uh, on a totally different subject, this is the dog park at Lagoon Valley. Uh, the lady in the front is washing the mud off of her stroller uh, tires because she found some mud somewhere and used the, uh, the dog wash hose to do that. Uh, but the reason I took the photo is um, to uh, let you know that uh, staff is looking at expanding, well, first of all, bifurcating the existing dog parks so that it'll have both a small dog area and a large dog area. This has been a long standing complaint from users of the dog park that we don't have that now. Um, and the idea it would be to expand a little bit at both ends so that we don't lose overall square footage for either user group. We did take an informal survey and um, uh, I would say probably 90% of the survey respondents, uh, this was not a statistically valid survey, but of those who responded were very supportive of the bifurcation. And uh, those who were not in favor were primarily the large dog users uh, because they, they didn't want to lose any space uh, to having an area uh, cut off for use by just the small dogs. So in order to try to make everybody happy, uh, our intention is to expand a little bit to the south and also a little bit to the north and, and then providing two completely separ separately fenced areas. Next slide, please. And again, on a different note, this is um, a view of the future dog park. The car, the city car that I, I parked there would be in the parking lot uh, of the small dog area. And this is in Roberts Ranch right off of Fry Road. So if you um, head east on, um, on Alamo and cross Leisure Town Road, as you're heading toward the railroad tracks, the road changes to Fry Road. And then you can make a left onto this drive, this driveway that was recently installed, and that will lead into um, the small dog area, the parking lot to serve the small dog area. And then on the next slide, I show the location of the large dog area. And that's right there. You can see the development has already put in the infrastructure to this area and uh, the uh, roadway, even the street lights are already in place. And the developer is anxious to get building uh, construction going on this on this first phase of the Roberts Ranch Community Park. Uh, we are also working on um, preparations, getting an agreement in place for construction of phase two, which will include uh, four pickleball courts. Uh, so that is yet to be yet coming. The developer is anxious to try to get some work done on this dog park yet this year. Next slide, please, Tracy. And then just to put a little green into your life, we're right in the middle of the end of summer, I should say. And I drove by uh, North Orchard Park. I guess it was a Thursday night. And this is typical uh, Thursday night activity going on in the park. It is just jam packed. We know this part of town doesn't have many parks uh, per, per the number of residents. And North Orchard and Alamo Creek Park are very, very active use areas. Um, it's it makes my heart glad to see all these people using the park, but it also looks a little crowded. If you were to be able to pan off to the right, you'd see there's also activities going on in the picnic area and in the uh, tennis courts, pickleball uh, area there, and also uh, even closer to the road. And I have one more slide to, uh, to show also. This is a slide that I took uh, last April uh, of the, Southern Hills, I'm standing in the Southern Hills, the Southern Hills open space south of the lower Lagoon Valley. Um, and just for context, I, I drew a, a kind of a, a pink line around the area in the center of the photo that uh, delineates roughly where the development area uh, will be located. And my reason for doing this is I want to emphasize that uh, the development is not going to be a, incurring in the park itself, other than uh, some of the infrastructure, which I already showed you photos of. And, and we will, I will continue to keep you apprised of uh, development as that moves along. Um, the infrastructure that's being installed in the park does disrupt uh, some park activities, although the, the contractor is, is working with us to make sure that the major events, uh, can, which are usually on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, can uh, proceed as as uh, as planned. Um, so just again, so the I know there's a little bit of confusion. Some public members occasionally think 
erroneously that there will be um, actual uh, uh, homes built and 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 uh, businesses built within the park itself, and, and that is incorrect. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. That is the end of my report for the night. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. As always, very informative, and thank you for your explanation uh, on Lagoon Valley there. At this time, I will open it up to the commission for uh, comments or questions. Commissioner Vander Tulin. Uh, good evening, you. This is Commissioner Vander Tulin. I believe you alluded to it, but maybe just just to clarify. So in Lower Lagoon Valley, the utilities that are going in, particularly the sewer lift station, is also going to be shared with the planned development that will eventually occur. Is that is that a correct statement? Uh, let me try to clarify that just a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the development is actually uh, paying for and funding the um, 100% the, uh, the development of the sewer lift station and the water booster station and all the infrastructure in between that will be located within the park. Uh, the benefit to the park is that basically we will get to use that sewer line uh, for the purpose of a new restroom building and, mm -hmm. and we'll get new paving on the, on the roadway too and fire hydrants along inside the park. Did, was that, did I make that a little more clear? Yeah, that, I just wanted to get a clarification because I, I was thinking for the park itself. Yeah. With uh, the, the size of the lift station, I somewhat surmised that it was also being, a, it was a benefit to the development that will eventually come. And I think he just clarified that, yes, it'll be a shared use between um, Lower Lagoon Valley, the park that's existing, and the future development when that comes online. Right. It is being built, number one, and primarily for the, the, the development in the South right. Valley. We just are the lucky uh, users uh, to be able to tap into it. Right. That's, uh, that was my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Any further commissioner comments or questions for Hugh Hesterman? Hugh, we're letting you off the hook uh, rather easy tonight, sir. My pleasure. Sir, I, I do have one question. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one that noticed, but uh, I did see a brass instrument sitting in that last picture. Can you explain that? Uh, I'd be happy to. I, I am a brass aficionado, uh, not a professional. Um, I love playing out in the open space. And that photo was taken Easter morning uh, when COVID was in full swing. And uh, we were not able to, uh, I was not able to play my brass instrument in church that Sunday. So I took it to the outdoors. Outstanding. Well, uh, it was definitely noticed and we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Moving along to um, item number 11, reports of recreation manager, Reggie Hubbard. Thank you, Commission Chair. Yeah, and thank you for that explanation, Hugh. I was gonna ask the same question. <laughs> um, I, I have a few things to share, a few programs to share that are upcoming for the department. Uh, next slide, Tracy. So we have a safe at home class that we're offering for kids ages nine to 12. Since kids are back in school and they could be at home by themselves, we want to give them the tools to be safe at home. Things to look for, you know, everyone gets packages delivered and things like that. Just put systems in place to help them feel safe at home and that their parents will feel safe leaving them at home. Um, we have a lot of power outages because due to, you know, the fires and things like that. So we just, uh, we wanted to offer this class to make sure that the, uh, the kids at this age feel safe at home. So this is October 9th, 10.30 to noon, ages 9 to 12. Uh, next slide, Tracy. Kind of tying into that is our baby, Babysitters Club. Uh, this is a class to help young kids become babysitters, um, teaching them life skills, um, and also teaching them to be safe at home as well. Um, this class includes, um, of course, babysitting skills, but infant and child CPR and a safe sitters uh, workbook. This class is a little longer than the other class. The other class was 90 minutes. This is a, almost a full day class. Uh, this one is October 16th, 8 to 3.30, um, at, also at the McBride Senior Center. Uh, next slide, Tracy. This is an exciting one. This is a tour to Vacaville. It's a scavenger hunt. Uh, many years ago, our department would coordinate scavenger hunts throughout Vacaville, and they were really popular. So we're trying to bring this back. 
this is it's two different occasions. It's September 20th and October 4th. Uh, you can play individually or you can sign up as a team. Um, the teams earn points by using a special app um, that they complete missions um, and just takes them around places in Vacaville, restaurants, local farms, local businesses. Um, it's just a fun way to get out and tour Vacaville, get more familiar with, with Vacaville. And so um, we're kind of excited uh, about this program as well. Uh, next slide, Tracy. Uh, last but not least, we finally instituted our scholarship program. Uh, this is an opportunity for families to get $1,000 credit on their account if they're eligible. It's for children 17 and under. Um, this is part of the Measure M funding that was approved, and this is something that has been supported by the commission um, and talked about by the commission and the city council about just making programs affordable, but giving um, our families in Vacaville the opportunity to uh, take part in a lot of the programs that may not be affordable to them. So this just started. I don't have the numbers right now to see how many families have taken advantage of this program, but hopefully at a next, at one of our future commission meetings, we can bring back some information to let you know how this program is going. But we're really excited about this program. We put it out there on social media. We're trying to advertise for it. So a great opportunity for our families to um, have another opportunity, another um, way of getting involved in our programs. And I will say, I'll just put a asterisk next to all the programs that I am speaking on, because as we know, the, the Delta variant is unfortunately um, spreading and we haven't been going in the right direction to that end. And so although we're anticipating running these programs, we're still preparing to either go back to some of these virtual programs, which we can do in some cases, but things like the scavenger, scavenger hunt and things like that, we may not be able to do, but there are some programs that we can go back to doing virtual. We're gonna continue to program um, as the CDC and the guidelines um, allow us to, but we're prepared to pivot if we need to do that. Uh, it's just one of those things where it's sort of day-to-day -day for our department. Um, but we've been there before. I mean, we've been through it. And I know vaccinations are out and different things to help us get through it. But at the same time, we're preparing ourselves that if we do go in the opposite direction, that we're, we're still able to program. And just like last year, we were we were able to offer the, the meal program for seniors and the senior assistance program. So this department is always willing to pivot and, and uh, do special things for the community. So we're prepared as we can be. Um, with that said, I think I will take any questions. Reggie, thank you very much. We will open it to Commissioner Comments. Commissioner Gutierrez. Hello, thank you for that presentation. I just had a really quick question about the scholarships. How many are um, available? How many will be given? There's not a limit on the amount of scholarships, but we we were budgeted $100,000 for scholarships um, this fiscal year. So if fa families can apply and if they if families go through the $1,000, if it's like a, a summer program or summer camp, I know summer's over, but something like TGIF and they have a large family, they can reapply. So right now we have $100,000 for this fiscal year to uh, coordinate this particular program. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Vice Chair Vasquez. Sorry, I was trying to find that unmute button. <laughs> um, I also had uh, questions about the scholarship program. Um, and sorry if I missed this somewhere, but what what is, so if someone wants to consider applying, what is the threshold for, for the application? Like, is it income-based? Um, how are you all assessing how folks are applying, like, I guess what's up? Yeah, what's the threshold? We tried to make this as easy as possible on our families, and we were using the same threshold that we were using for our reduced fee program. And, you know, I'm going to put Mel on the spot, and she probably has more information than I do about some of the things that you you can submit to our staff uh, to show that you're eligible for this program. And if you can, Mel. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, I'm just going to throw out there that website, cityofvacaville.com slash scholarships. That has all the details. So anyone who's out there taking notes, visit that website um, or any of our commissioners who are, are making notes um, to answer the question. 
they are based on the um, HUD low income threshold amounts. So for example, a family of two would have to have um, a maximum allowable income of just over 62,000 a year. And then there's a, a chart that is within our application that goes up to um, eight members of your family, which has a just over $100,000 um, maximum allowable income criteria. And as Reggie mentioned, we've tried um, really hard to make this a simple process. So there, we only require one um, proof of income element. Um, so that could be a tax return, um, proof of foster child support, state disability benefits, social security benefit, the list, there's about nine things on there. I won't list them all. And again, those details are on our application um, and they are on that website that you see listed here um, at the bottom of the, the flyer that's on the screen. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Of Thank course. you, Melody. Um, and then my other question is, um, so I think based on that last bullet, it means that the scholarship program is only available to um, parks and rec programs. Um, but is there consideration for other programs or other league registrations um, throughout the city? I mean, I'm thinking especially and particularly those that are already partnered with the city. So if there is an organization, oh, go ahead, Reggie. Sorry, did you want to? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mel. I don't um, take it. <laughs> we did talk about that, but some of the other organizations that we deal with or we have contracts with, they do have scholarship programs um, in their internal organizations. But one thing we talked about um, with our legal department is the potential of crossing that line of gift of public funds for the other mm. um, organizations. So that's one thing that sort of um, kind of threw up the red flag for that portion. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Leonard. I apologize if I missed it, Reggie. Um, if say a scholarship goes to a, a family with one child, how many years do they have to use their credit um, of $1,000? Do we have that determined? Yeah, they have until the end of the fiscal year to use that, but they can always reapply as, as funding continues. This funding, um, I know it's $100,000 this year, but it's for the next, I want to say five years um, funding. So if you have one child, um, what happens to the end of the fiscal year? And if they use that portion of their scholarship, they can apply again on July 1, once the budget has been approved. Okay, so it's use it or lose it. It's not transferable, right? True, you're correct. Okay, thanks. That's all I have. I'll just add on to that if I can, that we are planning to do a huge push during our annual expo, which is the big feeder event for our summer camps, which are the most costly programs for our families each year. And so we anticipate that there will be a heavy amount of the scholarship funds used um, to fund the upcoming summer 2022 programs for families. Oh, got it. Okay. Thanks, Melody. Of course. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Vasquez. Hi, sorry, something that Commissioner Leonard um, brought up. Um, so the funds don't carry over for um, the candidate of the scholarship, but if the Parks and Rec Department doesn't use the whole 100K for the fiscal year, do those funds then carry over to the next fiscal year? So if you all only use like 20K, the 80,000, you've got 180K for the next fiscal year in the scholarship program? We're definitely hoping we don't have that problem. We want to use it, but that's something we work with our finance department to, to determine if we can carry that over. And that would be great if we can. And I, I can't say yeah or nay right now if we can, but I'm thinking that we can. But we can get back to you with that with the answer to that question. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Gutierrez. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just had one other question as well. For the 17 and under, is the 17 um, have to be their age when their scholarship application has been submitted or by time the activity that they selected has started? You know, like if a kid is turning 18 in January, but the 
mother submitted the scholarship information in September, but the program doesn't start until February, does that make them ineligible? Yeah, I don't think we would make that would make them ineligible. If they were 17 when they applied for the scholarship, I think we would still honor that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any further commissioner comments or questions? I see none. Um, you know, once again, thank you. It's exciting to see these programs available, these scholarships available. Um, yeah, and I, I hope we have no leftover money. I hope that the families take advantage of this and um, let's get our kids out there in these great programs that um, this department has to offer. Thank you so much. Item 12, reports of director, Carrie Walker. Thank you, Chair McMahon. Just wanted to update the commission on a few things that are happening in the department. With regard to the Measure M Park projects, we're in the process of completing a number of scopes as well as agreements and sending those on over to the city attorney's office. And as soon as those are executed, we'll be moving forward with um, the public engagement process for each of those projects. Um, with regard to the department, I wanted to share with the commission that management analyst Sakura Witsi is leaving us and her final day with the department will be Monday, September 13th. So we'll be a little shorthanded for a while, um, but we are in the process of filling a number of positions that were approved during this fiscal year's budget process. And one of those is our full-time park planner position. Um, that was a conversion from non-full-time. Um, not prepared to make any announcements at this time in terms of uh, who that individual is, but uh, we, we're waiting for a number of these uh, uh, positions to clear so then we can make those announcements. But with regard to that, I wanted to, I wanted to thank Commissioner Vander Tulin for participating as a panelist uh, for that park planner position. Uh, also wanted to thank Commissioner Gutierrez for sharing all of that recruitment information that we have moved rapidly. I wanna thank Amber Hayes from our department who actually put a lot of that in place. A lot of your ideas and suggestions, like I said, we're, we're already uh, moving forward and have those in place. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of that. Much appreciated. One of the things that a number of you will notice on our um, emails with our information, we have included uh, Commissioner Guterres' recommendation to put a link to our uh, job information, job announcements. And a lot of us have also included the link to the scholarship program there. And I think that's about all I have to share this evening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Director Walker. And uh, we'll open it up for commissioner comments or questions. Vice Chair Vasquez. Um, hi, Director Walker. Thank you so much for those updates. Um, Oh, that's really, really helpful. Um, something I was actually wondering about in in the update portion or reports of director, if maybe we could do updates on um, the status of some of the items that we've approved or recommended um, and where they are sitting in terms of have they gone to planning? Have they gone to city council? Um, I know during our facility tour, I asked about um, some of these, like where the status of like Nelson and um, Alpatch, um, if we could potentially do that at some point or as part of the reports of the director. Um, I see sometimes the um, on planning commission, the um, uh, I believe facilities director or um, um, no planning director, <laughs> sorry, um, I couldn't think of the title. Um, we'll do that in terms of like where the status of, of different things that the commission has moved on um, and, and where they're at. I think that would be really helpful. Absolutely. And just quickly with regard to both Nelson Park and El Patch Park, you are correct. The commission approved the master plans for both of those facilities. We haven't moved forward into the design phase. Uh, part of the reason being that, again, as you're all aware, that a committee is 
um, scheduled to uh, be put together to review those measure M projects, potential measure M projects that exceed $10 million. And so both of those projects would be considered, um, you know, as by that committee um, and prioritized. So at that time, you know, we'll be able to determine, you know, what projects will move forward sooner than later and uh, what that what all that's going to look like, but that will be that committee that is comprised of both commissioners and council members. Thank you very much, Director Walker. Uh, Vice Chair, any further comments or questions, ma'am? No, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, great suggestions. Okay, any further commissioner comments or questions for Director Walker this evening? Commissioner Leonard. Hi, Director Walker, along the same line as Vice Chair Vasquez is, um, if uh, I don't know the, the most appropriate vehicle for that, whether it's an email or, or an agenda item, but if we could get an update on the progress with the tennis community and some of those um, solutions and, and conversations and possibilities that Reggie offered, um, that would be greatly appreciated as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Leonard. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Director Walker, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Item number 13, reports of the commission. Um, tonight we will start with um, a fun event. We have to discuss commissioner volunteers to judge costumes at the Halloween event that is scheduled for Saturday, October the 30th. Um, so I understand the staff is looking for three commissioners to volunteer for this to be judges for this. I have had the opportunity to do it once and it's a fun day. Um, so at this point, we're looking for three commissioners to volunteer to be a judge on that day of October the 30th. Commit, uh, Chair McMahon. Yes, ma'am. We don't absolutely if we if we don't have the volunteers we don't absolutely have to have three so i don't want people to feel guilty that they have to do this but we cannot have three is the maximum that we can have so we're willing to take any number up to three okay understand thank you very much so uh is there any of the commissioners here tonight that would uh, like to volunteer for uh this opportunity What's the time frame for the event? Can staff answer that? What uh, what time would we be looking to do this? Um, let it's, me see. It's a morning event. It's, um, it's, the event is from 1130 to 1230 on Saturday, October 30th. And it's the dog parade and costume contest. So that's what you would be judging. Oh, you can count Commissioner Barroman in. All right, very nice. We have Commissioner Bruman as one of our volunteers. Um, any other commissioners? Commissioner Vander Tulin? Sure, why not? Sounds like a fun event. Absolutely, it is a fun event. So very good. We've got Bruman and Vander Tulin. Um, anyone else? This is Commissioner Leonard. If there are other commissioners, um, that really want that third seat, I, I'm happy to take it, but I'm also happy to yield if if there's another commissioner that would like that opportunity. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, at this point, why don't we, uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll look at Bruman, um, Vander Tulin, and Leonard. And I think there's room for um, change there if we need to. Um, I can absolutely be an alternate for that. So I thank you um, very much for volunteering. And um, it, it's a fun event and I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we will now close with commissioner comments. Commissioner Bruman. Um, just want to uh, thank uh, Rachel and Lisa for their presentation. And it can hopefully one of these times we'll be able to watch some performances inside again. Um, again, thanks staff for all your hard work and all programs you're putting in place, I know. And now you're losing another person, so. I commend you for your hard work and 
obviously patience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Gutierrez. I would just like to thank the entire Parks and Rec team for putting on an awesome um, creek walk season, although uh, a little bit shorter than, than normal, but it was just great to, to see everyone out there again. Um, it was nice seeing Chair McMahon behind there doing the, doing the running the commission booth or the concessions booth. I think you did it a couple of different weeks when I saw you out there and I had an opportunity to meet uh, Director Walker's husband as well. So it was nice. It's nice to see people out of their element, work element, um, enjoying and also seeing people in their work element. Melody, I saw you out there um, as well. So I just want to congratulate the team on having just a great creek walk season. Again, it, although it looked a little different, it, it was just amazing. And I think now hearing that Fiesta Days isn't going to happen, at least the community had you know that time to come together and, and listen to music. So again, congratulations. Absolutely, those are great points. Um, and thank you for uh, just making all that happen to the staff. It was uh, much needed for this town and you did it in a safe manner. Thank you so much. Commissioner Leonard. Thank you, Chair. I just, I wanted to commend staff um, on their continued partnership with um, the Vacaville School District um, and facility sharing and, and our ability to um, partner and find the win-win um, with facilities, um, but also make a huge difference um, for students in city facilities. And that's a lot of work, I know, and, um, but uh, you, you do a great job in how you handle that. And, and as schools get back in session, I know those things are gonna be really important. So thank you for your continued um, commitment to that relationship with the school district. Thank you very much, ma'am. Commissioner Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I um, hope that this um, return to Zoom is short-lived and we can go back. It was nice to see everyone in person last month. Um, however, I do want to commend staff for being proactive and already looking ahead at um, possible contingencies and pivoting and being flexible for community programming because that is important. So I appreciate staff's flexibility and foresight um, on those events. And that's really all I have. Hopefully this is short lived. We can see each other in person again soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Vander Tulin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, again, a great presentation by staff. As one of the newer members on the Parks Commission, I'm always amazed and impressed by the amount of activities that the city of Vacaville puts forth to the community. I think at times it's unrecognized and, and the time and effort to put these programs together, um, quite amazing and a benefit to the community. Um, I also want to share that um, I was, as mentioned earlier, I participated as a, one of the members in reviewing the applicants for the full-time landscape architecture position within the city. I think it was a very strong group of candidates. Um, this will all be curious what the final outcome of that was, but again, really well constructed, um, a good afternoon or good morning and early afternoon with the group that was there. So um, again, thank you very much for uh, enabling me to participate and that's it for me tonight. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Vice Chair Vasquez. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so I feel like it was a busy summer and literally school crept up on us so quickly. Um, but we have been busy with school starting and um, moving into fall sports. Um, but I do have just a couple of updates. So I wasn't able to attend the July 14 Arts Advisory Committee meeting um, that was canceled. So I do anticipate there will probably be one in October. Um, I saw that three new members were appointed at our last meeting that unfortunately I wasn't able to attend, um, but looking forward to meeting those new members um, for the Arts Advisory Committee um, at next month's um, meeting. Um, I was able to attend our in-person facility tour on July 4th um, and also met with staff on July 29th with Commissioner Thompson to discuss uh, field rental issues with the leagues um, and the city during the summer, um, which was helpful and productive. Um, 
what else? Uh, Tracy, I love the new PowerPoints. They look amazing. So kudos to you. Um, I love that they have the agenda item on the bottom. It's really helpful for our community members who are following along in Zoom or on YouTube to know um, what item we're on on the agenda when we're in um, various different PowerPoints. And um, you're always great. Just able to fluctuate between multiple documents. Um, and thank you all for volunteering for the October 30th event. I wish I could be there. Like I said, we're in the thick of fall sports right now with um, soccer. Um, and just wanted to also thank Socorro. Um, um, congratulations on your new position, whatever that may be. But thank you for your help um, with all the leagues um, and getting to know you through YSAT and through the commission um, and all that you've done with Parks and Rec. So with that, I hope everyone has a great night um, and I guess we will see you in Zoom in September or, oh gosh, October. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair. Um, uh, thank you, I agree with everything you said. And I, I also wanna say uh, Tracy is great. She just makes great things happen all the time for us and we appreciate you, Tracy, thank you. Um, in closing tonight, again, I want to thank you. Um, thank you, Socorro. We see you have been around as long as I have been around um, doing this. And uh, we appreciate everything you've done for um, these programs and this department. So uh, best of luck to you and your um, new adventures. Then also, um, on a more sad note, I would like to uh, close our meeting this evening in honor of the 13 service members that recently lost their life serving our country overseas. Uh, they paid the ultimate sacrifice serving our country and also uh, more closely to home. Sadly, we lost one of our own, Mr. Jesse Nelson, who was the public sport maintenance superintendent, um, sadly passed away on August the 29th. Um, you will be missed, sir. And um, with that said, we will close this meeting in their memory until Wednesday, October the 6th, 2021. Good night, Vacaville. <laughs>